Ooh, isn't that cool? Okay, welcome everyone. Let's talk about labor unions. Uh, our textbook uh, didn't mention labor unions that much, uh, so I want to do this lecture to cover it uh, because it's important and I think it will become even of greater importance in the future. So let's start out with some basic history. Why do we need labor unions? Uh, if you go down to Greenwich Village to Washington Place, 23 uh, to 29 Washington Place is this building. It's called, and let me get my pointer because I like to have my pointer. It's called the Brown Building. It's part of uh, NYU. Yeah, NYU is down there. Ooh, nice transition, Bill. And this is the building on March 21st, 1911. Uh, back then it was the Triangle Shirtwaist uh, Factory. And on March 25th, it had a fire. Uh, 146 workers died either from burning to death, smoke inhalations, inhalation, or jumping from the roof uh, to the ground. Uh, 123 were women, 23 were men. The average age of the victims was 14 through 23. They were working in the shirtwaist factory. They were seamstresses. Even people as young as 14, it was a sweatshop. And the uh, uh, doors and fire exits uh, to the factory were chained shut uh, to prevent uh, workers from getting some air or going out for a break. And uh, this uh, you know, tragedy highlighted in the United States the need for uh, labor unions and the need for control of uh, the excesses of capitalism. And another example, uh, back in 1921, uh, about uh, 10,000 West Virginia coal miners wanted to unionize. Here we see a picture of uh, some West Virginia coal miners. These are not midgets. These are kids working in the coal mine. Uh, as you can imagine, not very healthy uh, for them. Uh, during late August and early September of 1921, uh, the owners of the uh, uh, coal uh, mines uh, sent in 300 strike breakers with machine guns and bombs. They had aircraft dropping chemical bombs. Uh, 100 workers were killed. So, uh, simply put, these are the strongest arguments why we need unions. Uh, because without unions, uh, company owners will exploit workers. Company owners can organize uh, to exploit workers in order to make as much money as possible. So it's only fair that the workers be able to unionize or organize in order to protect themselves. And a little bit more about the history of unions. Uh, the heyday of unions in the United States was 1945. Back then, about a third, 35%, belonged to unions. Uh, that fell to 12.9% by 2003. Uh, and you usually see changes uh, in union commitment when there's a threat of job loss, when you have uh, economic con conditions where people are worried about their jobs, people generally tend to join unions then. And also public sector workers, that is public employees like me uh, that work for CUNY, we usually have a higher uh, union membership rate of 30, you know, and nationally that's 33%. Uh, going by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, so this is official stuff, uh, union membership in terms of the total workforce uh, was 11.1% uh, in 2015 and it dropped uh, about a percentage point, uh, a little less than that, to 10.5% uh, uh, in 2017. I think the last year that they have data for. And uh, when we look at the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire or the uh, Blair uh, uh, Mountain uh, situations where we see these workers uh, don't have any protection and they're being exploited. And this is a current uh, article from The Guardian uh, about uh, Amazon. Uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, the owner of Amazon, is the richest person in the world. He's a billionaire. 
uh, yet uh, his employees are left to suffer after workplace injuries. Uh, his workers are not allowed to go on bathroom breaks. Uh, they usually will pee in bottles on the factory floor uh, because uh, they don't have the time to uh, go to the bathroom. And Amazon is not unionized and uh, workers are trying to bring unions to Amazon to represent them and Amazon is fighting uh, unions as strongly as it can uh, because the reason why Jeff Bezos became the richest man in the world is he exploited the labor of the workers. Oh, I sped it up a little bit. I don't know if you noticed during the transition. Uh, so some highlights uh, of current data. Uh, two, 2015, as I said before, public sector workers had union membership rates, you know, like 35%, more than five or six times higher than the private sector workers of 6.7%. Uh, workers in protective services and education, uh, training and library occupations had the highest union rates, 36.3 uh, and 35% respectively. Men continue to have high, a slightly higher union rate uh, membership rate than uh, women, 11.5 versus 10.6. Black workers were more likely to be union workers than were white, Asian, or Hispanic workers. Other union membership highlights, when we look across the entire economy, uh, if you're a union member, on average, you earn more, about uh, $200 a week more than non-union workers. Also, if you're not in a member of the union, but you are represented by a union, uh, you get to uh, ride along for free on that, but notice how much it benefits you also. You again make about $200 a week more uh, than non-union workers. I'll get to this free rider phenomena in a little bit. Uh, New York continues to have the highest union membership, 24%. Yay, New York. South Carolina has the lowest, 2.1%. Uh, a little bit more about salaries. Uh, this is from 2015 Bureau of Labor Statistics. And uh, this is the breakdown of salaries of union members, people who are not in the unions but are represented by one and non-union members and of course you can see overall that there are gender and ethnic disparities based on uh, your salary that is women are paid less uh, than men uh, and uh, you know blacks Asians and Hispanics are paid less than white people but if you'll notice if you're in a union Union membership protects you from those gender and ethnic disparities. So that's another benefit of being in a union. Uh, while there may be gender discrimination or ethnic discrimination against uh, you, uh, you, know, uh, you know, union membership will tend to protect you from that type of discrimination. And a little bit more history and getting to current history, the Wagner Act was known as the Labor Peace Law. Uh, and I presented those examples of the uh, Triangle Shirt Fire and the uh, uh, you know, Blair Mountain uh, War uh, as examples of why it was needed. Uh, the Wagner Act was called the Labor Peace Ma Act because they, uh, the co country back in 1935 needed uh, labor peace. They needed to give concessions to the union. Uh, unions so that they would have a strong legal uh, standing and they would not have to resort to violence to protect themselves. And a major part of the National Labor Relations Act, which is known as the Wagner Act, was the setting up of different types of union uh, businesses. Closed shops uh, are uh, companies where they require uh, union membership as a condition of employment. So uh, before you uh, you know, can actually get a job, uh, you have to join a, uh, the union and be a member of the union in, in good standing in order to uh, get employment in that uh, company and in that field. Another type of uh, union uh, 
uh, businesses they set up or union shops where uh, you could uh, you know uh, take a job before you were a union member but you had to join the union in a certain time period uh, and then agency shops uh, this describes what I was talking about before uh, in an agency shop uh, what happens is you can choose to join the union or not but if you don't join the union you still have to give the union an equivalent of what the normal dues are and uh, so you're not a voting member of the union but uh, you are being protected by the union and I'll talk more about that in a, a little bit to explain that and so this went on uh, you know for about 10 years then in 1947 the Taft-Hartley Act uh, allowed states different states to repeal the A uh, Wagner Act for union and agency shops that is to get rid of the union and agency shop de designations for businesses uh, you know uh, state by state this act the uh, uh, Taft-Hartley Act is called the right to work act and uh, there's dr. evil there telling us that is quote unquote right to work uh, it, right to work man that sounds like a really great act uh, it's gonna do good things it's gonna give you the right to work no it's not uh, here are the states in green uh, which have passed the task Hartley uh, Hartley laws uh, that uh, eradicate uh, union and agency shops and uh, what does this do uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, spoke directly about right to work we must guard against being fooled by false slogans such as right to work it is a law to rob us of our civil rights and job rights its purpose is to destroy the labor unions and the freedom of collective bargaining by which unions have improved wages and working conditions for everyone. Wherever these laws have been passed, wages are lower, job opportunities are fewer, and there are no civil rights. And uh, here is a quote from uh, you know the uh, union website, the AFCME website, about the racist uh, background of the right to work uh, where uh, during the campaign to repeal uh, the uh, you know the uh, union and uh, agency rules in Arkansas uh, they distributed flyers uh, that talk about if they failed white women and white men would be forced into unions labor unions with black African apes uh, who they'd have to call brothers or lose their jobs and so the right to work uh, movement certainly exploited racial fears in order to encourage these uh, people in these states to pass laws to uh, uh, do away with union and agency shops what happens then well then you have free riders uh, in that uh, you know you can be at a company that is union represented uh, but not pay uh, union dues you don't join the union or you just you don't even have to pay your union dues and so you have free riders people who are not paying their union dues but they are getting represented by the union in terms of collective bargaining and also uh, the courts ruled that the unions had to uh, uh, you know, represent in grievances uh, these free riders and even worse uh, in June of 2018 the US Supreme Court uh, ruled in a case called the Janus case and there's that union again uh, that uh, you know the uh, you know union and agency shops are unconstitutional and so now agency sh agency shop law is illegal and so then it could allow any company where there is a majority union representing uh, the members uh, that uh, they could allow non-members to stay in that uh, uh, organization stay in that business not pay union dues not pay agency fees but the union uh, would represent them in collective bargaining 
and the union would also represent them in grievances. So they really are uh, getting the benefits of something without paying for it. And let's talk a little bit more about agency shops because up until 2018, uh, CUNY was an agency shop. That is my union, the college professor union here, uh, or the union for all of the professionals is the Professional Staff Congress, the PSC, and this was an agency shop. So uh, back uh, 17 years ago when I came here to CUNY I was given the choice. You can uh, join the union or you cannot join the union. If you join the union uh, you have to pay union dues. If you don't join the union you have to pay an agency fee which is the same as union dues. And I joined the union for several reasons. And uh, the union represents the almost 8,000 full-time faculty, uh, the almost 12,000 adjunct faculty members, graduate students, continuing education teachers, higher educational officers, uh, and CLTs. So uh, the union represents pretty much all the people that you come into contact with uh, while you're at CUNY. And uh, what do you get uh, you know, when you uh, join the union or now that Janus has been uh, passed? Uh, you know, we're not an agency shop anymore, so I forgot to get rid of that, so let me get rid of that right now. Not an agency shop anymore. So you can join or not join the union. If you uh, join the union, uh, you get uh, you pay one percent of your salary, uh, and that is your union dues. And what do the union dues uh, cover? Uh, they cover uh, basically collective bargaining. That is uh, when the union goes and they negotiate collectively for a new contract, a new working contract with CUNY. Uh, this contract covers uh, things such as how, when we have to work, how long we have to work. Uh, it also covers, uh, you know, our salaries, uh, our benefits, and it also covers uh, working conditions. Uh, the health conditions at our school, for example, are mentioned uh, in our union contract. Uh, so, uh, what happens when you join the union? And in the past, I said these free riders, and now they truly are free riders, get all these benefits for free. Uh, when the union and the PSC dis, uh, agree upon a new contract, uh, non-union members who aren't paying their dues, they get you know the benefits also. Uh, so that's one set of benefits, the uh, collective bargaining. Also, the grievance procedures. Uh, as I said uh, in a recent lecture, uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know uh, you know uh, as I said in terms of at will employment uh, you cannot be fired if the firing violates some type some part of a contract and so that contract negotiated by the union is the basis of grievance procedures so if you are going to be disciplined or if you're going to be fired uh, by uh, CUNY and you can say well that firing violates my contract and that begins a grievance process that is laid out in the uh, contract where uh, you have to go through a legal process and CUNY has to go through a legal process uh, before they can fire you or before they can discipline you. And so these are the benefits of uh, being at a union organization, even if you're not paying. Uh, if you're a non-member of the union and you're not paying, uh, you don't pay, you get an extra 1% salary, more or less, and you get all these benefits for free. Uh, and uh, as I said before, grievance coverage uh, the contract guarantees rights to workers. It ensures uh, the due process for these rights. For example, fair classroom observations. Uh, you know, somebody could try to get rid of a professor 
by doing uh, unethical things in terms of the evaluation. So in the contract, uh, the uh, classroom evaluations that uh, young professors get uh, every semester are spelled out in the contract. And if uh, CUNY doesn't follow those specifics, then they can't use the classroom observation data uh, in terms of uh, firing or rehiring a professor. Deadlines to be uh, informed of non-reappointment. This is very beneficial to adjuncts. So adjuncts don't find out two days before the semester begins that their class has been canceled and they don't have a, a class to teach. So that allows them to better uh, you know, plan their budgets and when and where they're working. By the way, this from uh, several years ago is uh, uh, CUNY's uh, or York's uh, uh, union uh, negotiating team. Uh, I'm not there because I was uh, in class at that point, but I was a member of that team uh, just like uh, some of the professors and staff members you probably will recognize there. Besides, uh, you know, what I've laid out before in terms of the contract and protections, uh, I wanted to talk about the bigger picture too, and I have this YouTube video, which is about five minutes long. It talks about the union at Sequins International here in Queens and how they actually helped a health and safety issue uh, with the workers. A uh, health and safety worker that was not being addressed by the company, that was not being addressed by law. Uh, the union was there to make sure that uh, the company was doing things that allowed the workers to work on the factory floor without injuring themselves. So another reason why unions are important. Uh, and as I said before, collective bargaining is another benefit of being in a union. And here's me wearing my PSC hat at a union rally. Uh, and so the collective bargaining agreement covers work rights, that is when we can work, uh, when we don't have to work, uh, workload, how many classes we have to teach, pay, and benefits. And uh, that's guaranteed, my pay is guaranteed in the contract. In fact, if you don't know this, you can go online and you can look up the salaries that your professors get. For example, I'm an associate professor and so based on the union contract, and it's a contract so it has to be listed, these are the salary steps uh, that uh, I go through. That is what happens is once I begin, once I was promoted to an associate professor, I was placed in one of the salary steps and then every year, each year, I go up one step until I get to the top of the uh, category. And then I stay at that, whoops, I stay down there until I get promoted to, whoops, I'm sorry, full professor. And then I go from here to around there, more or less. And then I start going up year by year. So uh, that's how the uh, contract, oh, I screwed that up. Notice I, I'm going across different years. The, the idea works, so I'm not going to redo the whole talk. And, uh, for example, a current benefit is that uh, in the last week, uh, CUNY and the PSC reached a new contract deal. Uh, and this was a historic contract. Not only uh, do, uh, every, does everyone get a 10% cost of living increase for five years, which pretty much covers cost of living, uh, but what is not really discussed in this Wall Street Journal article uh, that much or not highlighted is the fact that uh, we have been able to negotiate a 30 to 45 percent increase in the salary of adjuncts. Uh, the adjunct professors that teach your classes that don't work here full time at, at uh, York, uh, they get paid about $3,500 uh, a semester for one class, one three-hour class. Uh, and that's less if you look, work out the time it takes to meet with students and to grade papers and prepare uh, projects and lectures, that's less than minimum wage. 
And so this is historic. Uh, I think we're paying adjunct professors uh, the most in the entire nation. And I think this is a very important thing, not just for the adjunct faculty, but for students. Because I was just speaking uh, to an adjunct professor about what textbook they should be using. And for one class, we have a, a standard textbook. And you know, uh, he had you know, lectures and classes prepared for another textbook. And I said, yeah, go ahead and use it. Uh, it's not our standard, but you know you're being paid so little. I don't want you to make. I don't want to make you redo everything, and that's you know a way in which the pay that the adjuncts get really causes not that perfect education of students, and so now when we can say that our adjuncts are being paid at a level where they can focus on work here. Uh, we can uh, do things with our adjuncts uh, to allow better education for students. And as this uh, you know, uh, 2016 uh, news story suggests, labor unions, professors, and students protest Como's budget, CUNY budget cuts. Uh, the state of things at CUNY uh, are really based on the decisions that the governor is making regarding CUNY. Uh, and one of the groups that really uh, works very, diff very hard to go and petition uh, the uh, state senate and to bug the governor about this is the PSC, that is our labor unions, which is professors. And of course, we're often joined by SGA, student government, as we go to Albany. And uh, it's really important to put as much pressure on Albany and the governor uh, to essentially, uh, you know, to create a situation where CUNY's budget is protected, because right now it's not. Uh, state law says that the governor can use the CUNY budget for whatever he likes, and he does that. He moves money out of the CUNY budget to fund bridges or things like that. And uh, also, there is no memo of agreement or MO. And what that is, would be is that that would be a binding agreement that the governor and uh, the, you know, a state of uh, New York make with CUNY saying that we're not going to take money away from you and also we're going to continue uh, you know to fund CUNY at this present level or higher in the future because what happens is that uh, CUNY is told oh we're gonna fund you at this level and then two years later the governor comes and says oh I'm sorry we have to take that money back and it's impossible to plan things or run a university in a situation like that. Okay, and uh, this is the slow transition because there's Luna uh, at, sitting at my desk and we're here to say goodbye and thank you for your attention.